So uh, welcome everybody again and good morning and good evening for some. Um, we're so happy to be learning with you again for this second part of uh, 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 our journey through Genesis, Joseph and Jacob with Rabbi David Sperling. Um, Silver, sorry, I'm looking at the wrong thing. Rabbi David Silver. Um, I just want to explain that um, if you're joining us on Zoom, I'm going to be inviting you to be a panelist. This just means you can turn on your camera if you wish, so you can see your beautiful smiling faces. Um, if you want to turn your camera on, and it means that when um, uh, Rabbi Silver invites questions, um, you can unmute yourself and ask them uh, directly. Um, if you wish, you can put questions in the chat box. If you're joining us on Facebook, you can put comments. Uh, comments and questions in the comments and I'll bring them to the Zoom so that we can hear your questions. Um, we just ask that when you uh, have uh, finished speaking that you mute yourself again so we just minimise background noise and we can all hear each other. I will be sharing uh, the sources on Safaria but of course you're very welcome and encouraged to be following along in your own Tanakh or your own Safaria uh, as well. So, yeah. Thank you very much. Okay, let's continue our journey through Genesis. So we're in chapter 43, the story. So we remember that uh, Yosef has taken one of the sons of Yaakov hostage, that is Shimon, son number two. He heard that son number one, Ruvain, had actually tried to save him. So that he... Um, doesn't rain as we discussed, but he takes the second one, Shimon, who was also would appear to be a amongst all the brothers the most problematic in the sense that he was certainly a ringleader in the massacre of Shem, and it's pretty clear that he's the ringleader in the potential murder of his brother Joseph. Uh, he works in concert with his helper, with Levi, the accompanist, as his name suggests. So anyway, Yosef has him captive, hostage. And Yosef says, well, you, to prove that you're actually a bunch of family members, not a bunch of spies, you said you have one brother back with your father, bring him back and you will be proven to have spoken the truth and all will be well, etc. So when they come back home and they discover that the money they had paid for the food has been returned to them and Yaakov is very afraid, he may suspect them of missing brother, a lot of money, you know, maybe they actually sold their brother. Yes, in a normal family, you might not expect that, but this is not a normal family. And in point of fact, they had once considered exactly that. So Yaakov refuses to send Binyamin, the only son of Rachel left, back to Egypt. He's afraid. The other brother is missing. Another brother, Shimon, is missing. Yosef's gone. Shimon's gone. And Yaakov would not send. Meanwhile, there's no food. And they're running out of food. In chapter 43, they run out of food. So let's begin with chapter 43. It's a, three, uh, a verse with three words. The famine was heavy in the land. It was severe. So it gets worse and they have no food. Nobody has food except in Egypt. Joseph has wisely uh, produced or preserved food from the years of plenty, which he controls. He works for Paro. But Joseph's the one who doles out the food. So that was the second verse. When they completed, ate up all the food they had brought back from Egypt. So Jacob says, go back and get more food. Now, of course, one can ask the question, what do you mean go back and get more food? They already made it clear that they can't go back unless they bring back the oven. So what do you mean get more food? So there are different ways to understand it. One is nonetheless out of desperation get more food. Another possibility is it's always a possibility that maybe he doesn't believe the whole story altogether. The whole story with the, with the, with the, with the man in charge of the food in Egypt and pr producing Binyamin, you know, he knows Binyamin, Shimon's missing and there's a lot of money. Maybe the thing never happened. Maybe they're lying to him, as the, I would add, as they did once before. So, we have reason to at least 
raise the possibility that he doesn't believe them. It's possible. I'm not saying it's definite, but it's a possibility. Meanwhile, at this point now, Yehuda speaks up. He will be the hero here of the story. Yehuda speaks up and says, the, the man warned us, hey, 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 literally to testify against us, but to warn us, he said it quite clearly. Don't come back without your brother. Therefore, if you send our brother with us, we will go down and get you food. But if you don't, we're not going down. Why? He repeats himself because the man said, don't come down without your brother. Now, what's interesting here, in addition, Yehuda speaks up and he says something interesting. If we go down, he says, if you send a brother with us, it's up to you. We will go down, finish barat with ochel. And we will get food for you, Lecha. In point of fact, he's not getting food for you, for Jacob. He's getting food for everybody. But he puts it in terms of Yaakov's thing. And perhaps he's responding to what Yaakov said earlier. There's something very problematic about Yaakov's speech over here. It's a speech born of great pain. In the previous chapter, in chapter 42, in verse number 36, he says to the brothers, O Tishi Kaltem, you have caused me to be bereft. Yosef Einenu Vishimon Einenu. Joseph is missing. Shimon is, literally, Joseph is not. Shimon is not. And now you will take Benjamin as well. All these things happened to me. He puts it in terms of himself. And there's even a suggestion over there that whatever happened to Shimon happened to Joseph. In other words, He's suggesting the same way Joseph is missing, and I would add presumed dead. Shimon is missing and presumed dead. There is, if not a straight up accusation, there is a certainly a suspicion. And you would take Benjamin as well. What? He's a little bit younger. You get more money for him? So there's some suspicion. And Judah responds in kind. He says, listen, if you want us to get you food, you send the brother. Because, because we can't get food without him. What we told you before is true, whether you believe us or not. It's the truth. We can't go down without our brother. She repeats. At this point, this is where we last week sort of left off. Jacob speaks up. Yisrael. Here's called Yisrael. Get back to that later. Why did you harm me? Me, he says, not us. Why did you harm me to tell him you have a brother? At which point all the brothers respond, not Judah. By Yomru, they all said, The man asked, Sha'ol Sha'ol, they repeat the word Sha'ol for emphasis. The man asked us about ourselves, and our, and our family and our home, way more saying, this is what he said. Is your father alive? Do you have a brother? We answered the question in kind. Could we possibly know? Notice the repeat again. So they respond to their father. All of them respond. And notice, of course, what they're saying is not exactly what happened. He didn't straight up ask them about a father and a brother. They volunteered, in the early story, they volunteered the information. They were saying, we're a family, we're 12, we're 10 here, one back home, one missing. He didn't ask them straight up. So that's not true. At least it doesn't, it's not the text we have before us earlier. There may be other conversations, that's possible. But, it, but notice something else, that all of this is 100% irrelevant. Why did you say it? This is so typical. Why did you say it? And they're responding, all of them speak up. But it makes no difference why they said it. They said it, or he knows, or this is what he wants. So in point of fact, you can someday write a thesis about why he might have said it. But in point of fact, it's very simple. They have no food. The only place to get food is in Egypt. 
the guy in charge of the food says you're not getting it without it, without sending your brother. That's the fact. Why it happened, how it happened, who's at fault is completely irrelevant. But as we all know, when people are upset and things seem to go wrong and there are a million issues with the family, as there are over here, and all kinds of suspicions, people talk, as we say, Lola and Yan, with, with the great irrelevancy. So it's all irrelevant. And they're all talking, everybody's talking up. And now we come to the next verse. Someone's got to set the whole thing straight and talk straight. And talk sense. And that is Judah, Judah number eight. Now Judah speaks up a great speech. Judah spoke to his father Israel. Notice here he's called Israel. Sometimes in the Torah he's called Jacob and sometimes he's called Israel. And one of the, at moments of great significance in, this, in the narrative, he's usually called Israel. So Judah said to Israel, his father, this is a critical moment. Send the, send the young man with me. We will get up and go. We will live. We will live. We will not die. Here Judah talks a different line. Now we're going to get you food. We're going to get us food. We're all this together. We all have no food. Me and you and our little children. So therefore, send the boy with me. Now, Reuven had said earlier, send the boy with me at the end of chapter 42. But Reuven said, send the boy with me. And if not, you can kill my two children. Whether he meant that literally or not, that was not something that Jacob responds to favorably because it makes no sense. It also, as we spoke, is a failure of taking personal responsibility. And what Judah does here is take personal responsibility. Not you harm somebody else. Send boy with me. For, for the sake of all of us. And the next verse, of course, critical. I will guarantee it. I will be the orev. Hold me responsible for my hand. You can do ask, you can ask me. And if I don't do it, if I do not bring him back and place standing before you. I shall be guilty before you all of my days. Whatever guilty before you means, is a very powerful statement. In other words, I take full responsibility. And if it doesn't happen, blame nobody else but me. I'll take responsibility. And this is what we have to do. And the last verse, if we haven't tarried, tarry. is to tarry to take too much time. It's a word that appears only three times in the in the in the Torah. Lot when he leaves Sodom, he's told to leave Sodom back in chapter 19 by Yitma Ma, the angels have to pull him out. He he tarries, he delays. We already saw earlier in the text a Ruvain Lot connection. Lot said take my two daughters in chapter 19. Ruvain says you can kill my two sons in chapter 42. So Ruvain and Lot are similar. They're potential heirs, potential the oldest, as it were. But it's a failure of leadership, a failure to take responsibility. Lot wants to protect his guests. You don't offer your daughters. Either you offer nobody or you offer yourself, not your daughters. Ruvain similar in that respect. Maybe well-intentioned, <clears throat> but no responsibility. Says Judah, I'm, I'll be, you can count me the sinner. If we hadn't tarried, and as the Ramban points out, what do you mean they tarried? They ran out of food. No, says the Ramban, maybe they were stinting on the food, have these conversations. So we, we've, take, we've spent too much time, says, says Yehuda. We can't, you don't tarry, you make decisions and you act on them. We could have returned twice. Now that's an interesting expression. We could have come back twice already in this time. In point of fact, they will return again and they'll go back to Mitzrayim again which begins the exile. Maybe it's a foreshadowing over here. I wanted to point out something about this verse, though, and I'll stop and take questions. And that is, first of all, we spoke several times in the past about the beginning of verse uh, 9, which is, Anochi er venu the previous verse. I will be the RA. And of course, we talked about the fact that the idea of taking responsibility, particularly the word RA, which Judah says over here, which is the critical word in verse number nine, um, 
here they translate surety or a pledge. Back up, in the beginning of that, that's it. Of course, that lies at the heart of the Judah Tamar story of chapter 38. Chapter 38, the story of Judah and Tamar, which interrupts the Joseph narrative, is exactly where it's supposed to be. It's in the perfect place. The family is dissolving before our eyes. And the question is, can you build a family? That By that we mean, can you build a family which every member of the family is included? And that's what Judah succeeds in doing in Judah Tamar's story. The twins born to Tamar are both included. They're both included because they have to be included because Tamar has lost two husbands and Judah's lost two sons. So the levirate marriage there, the double levirate marriage, each one replaces one of the missing children. So by definition, they're both included. For the first time, you have two siblings who are both equally included. One may be primary, one may be secondary, but they're both included. But the way we get to that final scene of Judah and Tamar is Judah does two things. First of all, he confesses. Tzad kami many, he said. And secondly, he lies at the heart of the story is the pledge that Tamar took from Judah. What will you pay me for my, for my services, says Tamar, who dresses up as a prostitute. I'll send you a goat later. No, no, she says. I want something now. I want a pledge. I want an Eravon. The word Eravon appears three times. And as I pointed out when we studied it, those that studied Judah Tamar uh, with me, the point is, the beauty of it is that the Eravon, the pledge, the Ore, is somebody who guarantees, let's say, a loan, a guarantor. So the guarantor stands in relationship, let's say, to the lender. The guarantor is the second. The primary responsibility is the borrower. But if the borrower doesn't pay, then you go to the second, who's called the Ore. Judah, in the story of Judah and Tamar, is in fact the Ore, because there's an obligation of leveraged marriage in chapter 38, which devolves initially upon the brother. But Judah has forbidden his son to marry Tamar. He absolutely forbids it, and he sends her away. So Judah's relationship to Tamar is the second closest relative. So when you can't collect from the first guy, you go to the second guy. So he is the Ore. When he confesses, Sadkamimeni, he's admitting. He says, she's more righteous than I, for I gave her not to my son, which means in effect in the story. So she came after me because I'm the second. I'm the second closest. I'm the Ore. That's the lesson. And Judah hears this, understands this in chapter 38. Now the question is always, when you teach somebody something, do they really understand it or not? Who knows, right? And the answer, one answer is, well, if they know how to put it into play in another setting, then they understand it. And here we have the R.A. piece. We'll get to the confession later. But here we have the R.A. Anochi ervenu miyodi tevakshenu. So the Judah Tamar story, Tamar is the great teacher of Judah. And Tamar, in the Judah Tamar story, we have the little family of Judah being formed, strangely enough, uh, through Tamar, because both of the children born to Judah Tamar are both included, Peretz and Zerach. Peretz, of course, is the great ancestor of King David. The genealogy is found in the Book of Ruth, but they're both included. And so that's Judah's Rebbe, which is Tamar, has taught him the way you build family. And now he puts that into play, Anochi Erevenu. That's one thing Judah says. But the Chumash is not content with just that. That, of course, is central. And later on, of course, when Judah speaks to Joseph, he will say to Joseph, Abdecha Arab et Hanar, in chapter 44, in the great speech, let Benjamin go back to his father, because I was the Ore, I was the guarantor. So that he learns from Tamar. But there's something else over here that's extremely interesting in verse number nine. You see, the Chumash is very... Simple and very complicated. Simple verse. But he's saying something else. If I don't bring him back, that recalls for us a different verse. And the verse it recalls for us clearly is the speech that Jacob himself makes. When Jacob runs away from Lavan back in chapter 31, so Lavan chases after him, Lavan catches up with him, Lovin accuses him, why did you steal away, he says, and not only that, why did you steal my gods? 
And Jacob says, well, I had to run away from you because if I didn't steal away, you would never have permitted me to leave. You would have blocked me and my family from going home. So I thought you would steal your daughters from me. You were tigzol. They have the Chumash distinguishes between the Ghana and the Gazan. There you, there's we have the distinction of Ghana and Gazan. Why was I a Ghana? Because you're a Gazan. As far as these, these idols, I never took the idols. He doesn't know that Rachel took them. If you want to go search, go and search. 31. So, of course, love and searches everything and can't find them. Now we take a look. So, Jacob, after he finishes rummaging through the various tents of his wives and Jacob's tent, back in chapter 31, Jacob gets angry. This is found in chapter 31, verse number 36. Chapter 31 of Genesis, verse 36. Vayichar Yaakov Vayarev Bilavan. Can you get back to 36, 31? Chapter 30, sorry, chapter 31, verse number 36. That you, uh, 31, 36. Let's find that verse. Loading. Jacob gets angry. After 20 years, he gets angry at Laban. He got angry at his wife right away in the beginning of chapter 30 at Rachel when she said, Give me children. Yaakov got angry. Fine. But here he gets angry at Laban after 20 years. What is my sin? What is my hate? What is my hate? Jacob continues. You've rubbished through all of my belongings. What did you find? Let's see the evidence. Let's see the proof. And now Jacob, in the next verse, in verse 38, uh, reflects upon his own work. Jacob is a shepherd. I worked for you for 20 years. Your ewes and she goats never miscarried. Nor did I eat the rams from your flock. I worked for you for 20 years, and I never took anything that wasn't mine, and I took great care that your goats, she-goats, and ewes never miscarried. Lo shikeru. Next verse. I never brought back to you uh, something of an animal that was torn up. That's a trefa. Trefa is a torn up animal. If it was missing, the word hate, what is hate? To miss the mark. That's what the word hate means in the Bible. It means to miss the mark. By definition, it means uh, to sin also, but to miss the mark, you back up, right? If it were missing, then you could come to me in my hand, you could, you could, you could request it. Whether stolen by day or by night. In other words, what is Yaakov saying? I took ultimate responsibility for everything. I made no excuses. A trefa, you can't help it. Sometimes the animals get torn up. Sometimes they're wild beasts and they attack your, your, your sheep, the lambs, who are vulnerable animals. You know, there are powerful animals and forces out there. Says Yaakov, I never brought you back a trefa. If there was a trefer, I made good. If it was missing under my watch, anochi achatena, here's the key word, miyadi tevakshena. You could always come to me. I always restored it. I always paid it in my own pocket. Stolen by day or by night. He said, by night, how could you expect? You're working 24 hours a day. He continues, hayiti bayom achalani chor v'kerech balayla v'ati daj nati me'enai. Squashing heat by the day, and frost by night. Sleep fled from my, I worked for you 24 seven, says Jacob. And I made good on everything. I made no excuses. I took personal responsibility, you by contrast, says Jacob over the 20 years, I worked 14 years for your daughters and six years for your flocks, and you changed my wages 10 times. Now we come back to Judah's speech in chapter 30, in chapter 43. And you see what Judah is speaking, chapter 43, back to our verse, he picks up on exactly Yaakov's speech. He's talking Yaakov's language. Chapter 43, Jacob, yeah, Judah says, Anochi Erevela, if I take responsibility, he says, Miyadi Tavakshela, that was Yaakov's language. And Imlo, if I don't bring him back and place him before you, Bichatati Lucha Kohayamim, 
that plays up what Yaakov said. If it were missing, it's my fault. And that's what Yehuda says. Listen, I take response. By that I mean, there's no excuses. Just as Jacob had said, stolen by day, stolen by night, wild animals. I'm physically exhausted. No excuses. I promised I would deliver the goods. I deliver the goods. No excuses. Right? No excuses. And, and that's it. And so he's talking Yaakov's language. That's the way Jacob saw his, his, his work with Laban. That's what Yaakov says. And it has the ring of truth to it. You read those words. He's not making it up. He's telling the truth. And that's what Yehuda says. I take ultimate responsibility. It's the opposite of Ruvain. Ruvain said, kill my two sons if I don't bring them back. Says Yehuda, there's no excuses. It will be on your desk Tuesday morning. Don't, doesn't matter how. That's what's going to be. It's going to be there. And if it's not on a desk Tuesday, I take responsibility for that. That's what, that's what so it's, it's a combination of playing off Jacob's own language, Jacob's understanding of what it means to be a worker. The Talmud picks this up, right? Yaakov's work ethic, which is extremely high, high, you know, high level work ethic. It picks up on that. And of course, it plays off primarily on the lessons learned from Tamar, on Ochi Erevenu. And then he says, and we have to act decisively. It's another, another feature of Judah. We're not going to delay. We, we, we can't tarry. We can't be mitzvah meya. Yeah, mitzvah meya is, just, is a lack of, we have to make a decision over here. That's what Judah is saying. All this talk, why you say it, who said it, whose fault it is, irrelevant. Action is required. And Judah is all about decisive action. All the time we're wasting, we couldn't have been back already twice. That's Judah's great speech. And now we have Jacob's response to the great speech, which is the next verse. Oh, before, before that, let me stop for a moment, take comments or questions. This is one of the great speeches in the book of Rashi, but actually a turning point. And before I um, just take the comments or questions, if there are any, I want to point something out. That very soon we're going to be reading the Yuhat Esther. And... Um, the Megillah Esther story, as, as is well known, is based largely upon, not only, but largely upon the Joseph narrative in many, many different ways. Many ways, many pieces of language from the larger Joseph narrative are appearing in and are related to the Megillah. But if you have to, if you read the Megillah and you ask, what is the great scene of the Megillah? There's some very interesting scenes in the Megillah, some important scenes in the book. But there's one scene in the book, which is the critical scene in Megillah Esther, the great drama of Megillah Esther. And that is the scene in which Mordechai is trying to convince Esther, the queen, to intervene on behalf of the Jewish people. It's chapter four of the Megillah. And Esther doesn't, is unwilling to do that. She's willing to try to help Mordechai. She sends clothing to Mordechai is wearing sackcloth, which is mourning. And she sends clothing to Mordechai, get dressed. And Mordechai refuses to accept. He won't accept it. He doesn't see himself as separate from the people. How can I dress up if the Jewish people are, are under threat? Esther doesn't see it that way. So Mordechai sends a message, you don't, you don't get it. The Jews are going to be killed. And Esther's response is, well, whatever. I, Nothing I can do about it. I can't see the king. I wasn't summoned by the king. And you can't just walk in and see the king. And I haven't been called for 30 days. So there's nothing I can do about it. And Mordechai sends back another message. Listen, maybe this is why you became the queen. There's no, you can't do it. You have to do it. There's no choice over here. If you don't do it, maybe later somebody else will intervene. But this is your moment. This is your mission in life. This is your responsibility, as dangerous as it is. And Esther accepts. And Esther accepts with the understanding that it's a very difficult mission with a strong chance that she will not survive. That scene is playing off what we just studied here. That scene of someone trying to convince someone else. In the case of Esther, it's Mordechai convincing Esther to go to the king on behalf of the Jewish people, to put yourself in danger on behalf of the people 
in order to save the people. And that plays off the scene over here. The scene over here is where Jude is trying to convince Yaakov, convincing Yaakov to send Binyamin in order to save the family. And so you, you see straight up from the Megillah, the, 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 the writer of the Megillah sees the story over here as a very central scene. And I just wanted to make one additional point, which is this, that in the story of Judah and Tamar, the issue in the story of Judah, the issue that Judah has in the story of Judah and Tamar, which is centrally connected to the story over here, the issue is that Tamar is this mysterious woman that Judah marries in chapter 38 to his oldest son, whose name is uh, Er. And Er, the Torah says, is wicked in God's eyes and God kills Er. We don't know what he did wrong, but he's Er is Ra. Ayin race is Resh Ayin. He's wicked. And then son number two, so Judah says, son number two, reverent marriage. Marry your brother's, deceased brother's wife, and the child will be related to the kin lines of your brother. But Er refuses to consummate that marriage. She doesn't want her to have children because there'll be children that help his brother. He has no interest in that. When God sees that, God kills him as well. So now the two of three sons of Judah are dead. And Judah says to Tamar, why do you go back home to, uh, you know, I'll get back to you later. And the Torah says he was afraid that son number three would also die. So he sends her away to her father's house. He throws her out of the house with no intention of ever contacting her, clearly, because many years pass and he doesn't contact her. And Tamar understands that. But the, one of the points I made in that story, simple point, an important point, is that what Judy is doing over there, from a certain perspective, you can say, I understand it. He's a concerned parent. Two sons have died. He doesn't know why they died. He blames her in some way. Maybe she's just a bad, bad luck. Who knows? But somehow he blames her. He wants to get rid of her. Yes, he could have, he could have leveled with her and said, listen, goodbye. He doesn't do that. He, he keeps her attached so she can't go anyplace else. Not nice. But, okay, he's an overly concerned parent. We can understand that. We can sympathize. No. The point of the Chumash, though, is that the way the Torah sees it, there's not one son left. He has three sons. And if he doesn't perform the leveret marriage, then the kin lines of the first two sons cannot be extended. So what he's really doing is favoring one at the expense of the others. And that's the story over here in our chapter. That's the story of Jacob's behavior. Because what Jacob is doing over here in so-called protecting Benjamin we understand he wants to protect Benjamin, but he's protecting Benjamin at the expense of everybody else. And that's what Judah's also picking up over here. You know, it's not about you, he says it in a sweet way. It's about us. I'm gonna get the food, I'm gonna take the responsibility and we're all gonna live. You're gonna live and we're gonna live and our children are gonna live. It's about all of us. It's not about one particular person or one group. You talk about Judah as the progenitor of kingship, because that's actually what kingship is about. One of the main features of kingship is that the king leaves, leaves, leaves his family. He leaves his tribe. You can't be a king and be connected to your tribe. In the book of Shmuel, of course, the great book of Shmuel, at one point, that's David's mistake, where he favors his tribe. That precipitates the last civil war against David, the very end of the book. He favors the tribe of Judah. And the other tribes say, what are we? Chop liver or something? I mean, he's the king of everybody. And the 10 of them march off. Let's get our own king. If he doesn't understand you're the king of all, then he's not a king. King means one for all. It's one country. It's one people. Not one group. One people. And that over here is what is one of the things that at the heart of this great narrative is that it's not obvious, but it's really parallel to the Judah Tamar story in a very deep way. So that's a very important point for our narrative. Okay, let me stop you for a moment. If there are comments or questions, I'll, I'll be happy to hear them.
Are there comments or questions? I had one idea. Um, yeah. That Speak. in the in the pasuk that um, uh, Yehuda says, um, he uses the word nechye. Yes, um, he does. That um, and that was something that Reuven hadn't said. He was more focused on the future, um, as opposed, and it was giving it a different spin than Reuven had. And I think that he was trying to redirect what, um, how Yaakov would look at it. Yaakov was, you know, what was me and my past and my children that I have lost and projecting that it would happen again with Binyamin and which yeah. was understandable, but uh, Yehuda was trying to help him see we need to live and this is the only way forward. And I agree. I mean, Yeruvain talks only in terms of Binyamin. I will bring Benjamin back to you. He doesn't look at the bigger picture. He's, that's Yeruvain. I mean, there is something, I mean, the story is so real. In other words, people do behave this way. People are, look, Yaakov said it explicitly later on to Paro. And Paro said, how, how old are you? Not as old as you think. Not as old as my parents and parent and grandparent. I've had a miserable life, that's all. My years are few and bad. That's what Jacob says. And when you look at Yaakov's life from any objective standard, I mean, it's a tough life because his things didn't turn out the way he had hoped. I mean, he, you know, the mother who loves him, he leaves, never sees her again, apparently. His beloved son is missing most of his life. His daughter, Dina, is molested. And um, he ends up in Egypt, doesn't want to be there. He has to run away from his brother who wants to kill him. He gets ripped off by Laban. He ends up marrying not one woman before and all the internal conflicts between himself, his oldest son sleeps with his wife, Shimon and Levi, Salem, you name it. Um, it's a tough life, but he is the, at the end of the day, he accepts it. He says, okay, that's my role, to be covenantal, to suffer in the present, to build for the future. He's the hero of the book, Jacob, uh, probably the hero. And um, yeah, so people uh, given the situation and this point, which is really a low point for him, uh, his beloved Rachel died and she has, there's only one son left as far as he knows. The other one's a Nenu, missing and presumed dead, I would say. So we understand why he says it's all happening to me. But Judah has a, suggests a different perspective. No, so I mean, Yehuda, actually, Yehuda clearly sees you. this. Yehuda describes him as when he talks to Yosef, he says, my father had one wife and two children. And That's he's, true. He says that I mean, later. Right. Yehuda clearly knows this, but I think he's trying to help his father dig himself out and see future. Why? He is. I agree. Right. No, I totally agree with you. But later on, he does say that. It's incredible. Seems to accept it. But the point is over here. The point is over here. This kind of thinking doesn't get you anywhere because everybody needs the food. Everybody's in trouble over here. And Yaakov, because he's so miserable, doesn't see a way out. And Judah says, okay, so leave it up to me. And I'll, I'll, I'll take the responsibility for everybody. Not just for me, not just for you, but for the children, for the works, the whole family. And that's one of the great moments. And Yaakov actually responds to Judah. Yaakov says, okay. This is Yaakov's speech, which is very important. Same thing as Esther. I mean, Mordechai can tell Esther, you do A, B, C, D, E, but she has to agree to do it. And that's the great moment in the Megillah where Esther says, okay, gather the people, fast for me, I'll fast too, whatever. I'll go to the king and we'll see. It's parallel to the story over here. So there, Mordechai and Esther are the two heroes of the book. And over here, it's Yaakov's response, which is very important. And it's a very nuanced response, beginning in verse number 30, verse number 11. Let's take a look at that. Vayomer Aleihem Yisrael, Yisrael Abihem, Israel, their father. Now their father is speaking. Yisrael Abihem is speaking, their father. And what does their father say? The father of all the family. Im Cain, if so. Im Cain Efo Zotasu, if so. If you're willing to do this, take the responsibility. And here's my suggestion. First of all, so his first suggestion. Now we have to remember, we're reading the story in chapter 43. 
but this is one book. It's not something thrown together by someone who collects a bunch of documents and just throws them together. It's a unitary work. And the Joseph narrative is in fact the end of the book. So it plays off as such many other stories in the book of Genesis. And we see Jacob's responding over here. His first response is the same response he had earlier. Let's solve the problem by means of an offering, by means of a mincha. So exactly what he sent to Esau. And here he's going to send to this dignitary, to this person, the Ish, let's send him the gift. And what's he going to bring him? From the best, the choice things of the land. And he mentions them. Mat sari, mat devash, nechot barot, botnim ushkedim. These are expensive or exotic uh, produce, apparently not found in Egypt. Balm, honey, pistachio nuts, whatever they are. And some of these, when the traders were going down to Egypt and Joseph, they saw the Ishmaelites, the Chotu Tzvi Balot, three of the things mentioned there are all mentioned here. So these are, they bring them to, uh, to Mitzrayim. And of course, when you read this verse, you remember the fact that Joseph was brought down with exactly those things. So we have on one end the Mincha. Yaakov thinks in terms of the Mincha he gave to Esau to appease Esau. Uh, but over here, it's interesting that the very things he's sending, we call for the reader the very fact that Joseph was sent. In other words, it's, if you think about it, it's possible that these very things you send to Joseph might remind Joseph of the very fact and he was sold into slavery. So it's possibly, it's, it sounds like a wonderful idea, but Yaakov doesn't know this, but we know it, that these very items themselves were the items that Joseph, that accompanied Joseph down to Mitzrayim. And secondly, and more importantly, that whereas the Mincha could help with Esau, but we, the reader, know something that Yaakov doesn't know, which is, the really important point is not getting the food and saving Shimon. The important point is unifying the family. And Esav and Yosef are not the same because Esav is actually not somebody that you want to include in your covenantal family. You want to be on good terms with Esav. You want to do right by Esav. You mistreated Esav. So you want to appease Esav, appease the anger, and you want to you want to be uh, atoned for. You want to, Mincha is also not just a gift. Mincha is one of the sacrifices. So you want, as Jacob said, Achapra Fanav. I want Kapara. I want atonement. With Joseph, that's insufficient because we need Joseph as part of the family. Jacob wants to build the Bayit, and Joseph's an important part of the Bayit. So unbeknownst to Yaakov, that's not going to work. Okay, so that's the important point. That's number one. Then he has another point. Point number two, you have to return the money. The Kesef Mishneh Kuchu Biedchem, take a double portion of money. Now here there's a play actually on the word Mishneh. Mishneh means a double, two from the word Shnaim, or two. But Joseph is in fact the Mishneh of Melech. So bring back the Kesef of the Mishneh, which at least suggests to us, the reader, that we know the truth. That the truth is that it's the, it's the very Mishneh, it's Joseph who actually instructed that the money be put in their sacks for whatever his reason was. But, but the Kesef Mishnah, take the double Kesef. Beeta Kesef HaMushar B'fi Am Techotechem Toshibu B'yedchem Ulai Mishneru. And the money you found in your sacks, right? That was returned to you in the sacks, you should return Toshibu B'yedchem. Notice the emphasis on the word B'yedchem in your hands, which I presume means openly, not, not hidden. Come back with the money in your hands, make it obvious, and restore the money that was that was given to you. Jacob doesn't know, they say they don't know why they have the money. Okay, they don't know why. Maybe Ulai Mishgehu, maybe it was a shogeg in the sink. Notice the plan Mishneh and Mishgeh. Take the case of Mishneh, says Jacob, Ulai Mishgehu, maybe, I don't know. He says, maybe it was a mistake. That's number two. You got to return the money. And take your brother. And return to the man. And then Jacob adds at the end. And may God, El Shaddai. He uses that name of God. 
May this God, Shaddai, cause you to have mercy before the Ish. And send the other brother and Benjamin. The other brother, who was the other brother? So the other brother is presumably Shimon. And the Ramban says, I think very well, that here, on one hand, Achichem Acher, send the other one, because Shimon is the one son of Jacob who's the least favorite because of the story of Shechem, where Jacob condemns Shimon and Levi, and he condemns them later as well. Send the other one. But the other one could be hinting at Joseph. Not that Jacob knows this, but there's a kind of hint in the text. Whatever Jacob is thinking, there is another brother out there that we haven't we haven't, we don't know for sure is dead, missing and presumed dead, bloody coat, no body. So Jacob, not, Jacob still mourns because I haven't, we don't know for sure. He still has his hopes. So there is an intimation, there's an allusion, I would say, to, to Joseph. But of course, the other brother being Shimon, the one he doesn't mention by name because he's, he's not, not, not his favorite. God should send the other one. Or maybe the Ramban is saying something like, you know, when you're praying for something and you add other things into the prayer as well, God should restore our family. That's what Jacob is saying. And then he adds at the very end of the speech, Vani, as far as I'm concerned, Kasher Shokolti Shokolti. Now, what does that mean, Kasher Shokolti Shokolti? So there are different possibilities. Um, one possibility is if I am to be bereaved, I will be bereaved, which I think is not a bad translation. Um, the Ramban has a different interpretation, but what he's saying is, look, I would suggest the following. He's saying, we're gonna do these things. We're gonna return the money in an open kind of way. We're going to give a gift. We're gonna pray. But the end of all of this, with all of everything we're gonna do, and Judah, I appreciate you taking responsibility, but, Kasher shakolti shakolti. There's no guarantee that any of this is going to work. That's a very important point. What, Jay, what do we know? This mysterious ish. What's going on here? Who knows? Of course, in the Megillah, after Esther agrees, what does Esther say at the end of her speech in chapter four? Avani, kasher avaniti avaniti. So the Megillah writer plays off the story to the end. In the case of Esther, Kasher of vanity of vanity. If I am to be of vanity, I would say lost or destroyed. And that in the Megillah plays off the language of the Megillah. Because Haman thought, which means to destroy the Jews. It does not mean to exile the Jews, as some people have suggested incorrectly. It means to destroy them. If I die, I die. And that's very interesting because it has two possible meanings in the Megillah. That is, I may die for going to see the king at a time you're not allowed to see him. And if you do that when you're not allowed to see him, as to said, you, uh, you can be killed. Um, but um, but uh, on the other hand, uh, it could mean something else. Kasher validity could mean, if I am to die, I will die because I'm a Jew. If the, I'm identifying with the Jewish people who are under the threat of death. And as far as I'm concerned, once I go to the king as a Jew, uh, I may be killed for that reason. Not just because I'm entering the chamber at a time where it's forbidden, but rather because, uh, because, I, uh, because I'm Jewish and the decree is to kill all the Jews, including me, because I may now fully identify with the Jewish people. So that's where the um, that's how the uh, the um, Megillah is playing off the uh, the speech of Yaakov who responds to uh, to Yehuda. Okay, so let me see. Is there any other uh, any comments now? I'm happy to hear them. Um, I I think Richard had a question. Yes. Well, it was a comment rather than a question. Is it it's my worth the thinking of the possibility that when you 
cite uh, the connections with the words about between Yaakov and Lavan and the teaching, the ethics of the work ethic is that Yehuda was alive and was an old enough child to have been present and heard that speech. I really don't, I don't know that. Well, there's mean. enough, there's enough time. They, they were certainly alive and there were, you know, half a dozen, several sons born afterwards. Right. I, I don't know if you know, I don't know if we know we actually heard the speech. No, the, well, point is, the speech is reflective of how Yaakov sees his work. I mean, so the point is that the the writer, the biblical writer, is connecting the two stories. Biblically saying that Yehud is speaking the same language as Yaakov. He understands it's by understanding what the other person will respond to. I understand, this is making it up. I understand there's no proof, but the Text there says says it's he's doing it in front of the whole family. It's what it says. I mean that So he's it's a it's a production that's taking place in front of the family. So true. That's true. So Yehuda was old enough perhaps to have been part of that audience. That's certainly a possibility, right? So, now, for sure, that's certainly a possibility. But, you know, again, it's more about, I think the point of the story is he's someone who understands, which is a gift, what people are going to respond to. He's trying to convince his father to do the right thing, which is the only thing you can do because the alternative is complete madness to just, because they have no food. I guess maybe they somehow be able to get by, but it's, the, you know, but there's a serious famine. So... Can they spin out skimp by? Maybe, but it's so we obviously there's a great danger. And the the leader understands what how the leader knows how to talk to people and knows what, what people are going to respond to. At the same time, I think it speaks very well for Yehuda that he is taking this kind of responsibility. And it's you know, it, it, it's emerging. What he's saying to his father is, I mean, the point I was emphasizing is he's saying, Father, I understand how you feel. About Binyamin, I was in exactly the same place as you. I also wanted to protect my third child at the expense of others, but I came to understand that's not right. I was taught that's not that's not a leadership. That's not a parent. Parent is parent of all of them. You can't just choose one and eliminate the others. And that's that's my understanding. So we have a whole big family here. We have a whole bunch of kids. We have a bunch of grandchildren. We got a gigantic family, and you focus on this one child. Rachel's remaining child. That doesn't work. So we have to figure out a way to, um, to solve the problem, which takes into account everybody. And that's what that's what kingship is about. The king is somebody who actually, as I mentioned, actually leaves his family. You can't be a king and be connected to your tribe or your family. You have no family anymore. Your family is the people. And if you do favor your family, that's when you get in trouble. So that's um, it's one of the themes of Shmuel. Okay, so this is anybody is it, else uh, comment here? Is, Rabbi it, is it possible that uh, that Yaakov still doesn't understand that it takes all twelve to build uh, the bayit? It's only at the very end uh, when he's about to die, or maybe when he blesses Joseph's sons, um, that he still doesn't uh, understand that. That's certainly a possibility. It's hard to know. He certainly does understand it at the end. That's for sure. And he, that's, that's really the great, one of the great, uh, the great narratives of Rashid is that story when Yaakov figures out a way to include Joseph. It's not so simple to include Joseph because you have to remember that when it comes to the brothers, they don't actually trust him. I mean, the last scene in the book after they bury their father in chapter 50, they say they're afraid Joseph's going to kill them. They believe Joseph intends to kill them after Jacob dies. So they go to Joseph and they say, our father commanded, please forgive them, we'll be your slaves. They offer themselves as slaves because the alternative in their head is that he plans to, to kill them. He holds this grudge against them for having sold him and almost murdered him. And it turns out that's not true. But my point is he's not a guy who people necessarily trust. His own family. So again, where Jacob stands at this point, I, my answer is I don't know. I don't think this is that. It's only possible that at this point, still, uh, you know, he doesn't understand how to. It's not just about Joseph. How do we include Joseph within the family? We know this earlier, by the way, that 
when he, Joseph has his dreams and the brothers were jealous, and Rashi comments, and I think it's an interesting comment, that Shammah means not just that Jacob remembered the dreams, but he wants them to, be, to come true. And if you want the others to bow down to Joseph, in the ultimate sense, that can't work because they can't build a family well when all the brothers are bowing down to one guy. That doesn't work. At the end of the day, by the way, it's very striking. He doesn't give Joseph the kingship. He gives it to Judah. As much as he loves Joseph, Judah, you are the ones that your brothers acknowledge because you're the leader, because you understand how to lead everybody, and they trust you. And in some deep way, they never fully trust Joseph. That's just the reality, not just of the book of Breshit, but the reality of the Bible. The, 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 na the nation splits along the lines of Joseph and Judah. The messianic dream is that someday Joseph and Judah can get together, but there's a real division. I, I would say this, Chaim, I would say that I think the Chumash, the Bible assumes, in my understanding of it, there are always divisions. It, there's always division. There's always people have disagreements and sometimes strong disagreements for all kinds of reasons. But we have to find a way to bring people together who, who, who don't agree. And when you can't do that, that's when, the, that's when the, you get into trouble. So he has a nation. If the nation has two different pieces to the nation and they just can't talk to each other, that's when you get into deep trouble. And I think that's a, a timely message in many, many places around the world, uh, both in states for sure, and I'm now sitting in the land of Israel, and we have a similar problem here at present. People don't talk to each other, which is a major issue. We have to find a way to get beyond the disagreements, which are always there. No two people are gonna agree and you can disagree about very important things. Each side has a good argument, you know? But so I think that's, that's very hard to know over here, but the, the, the book is about, what the Bible is about is, where the, they're never gonna love Joseph. It's never gonna happen. It doesn't happen in the Bible. There's always suspicion of him because they can't really understand him. He goes his own path, etc. Okay. That may be the case, but we still have to live with Joseph and we have to incorporate him fully and we're one people. And Joseph's very important. So that's, again, at what point Yaakov understands it, which is your question, I, I don't know. If at this point he still has, you know, questions about it. But, uh, but you're right, at the end of the book, though, we managed to, to overcome it. Yaakov really is the one, the main player. We'll get to that hopefully uh, in, in the coming weeks. Um, okay, anybody else have a last have comment? A yes, yes. I Oh, just quickly, you said the word lit by Maya is three times in the Torah, and you mentioned Lot. What's the third time? Lo yachu lehit by Maya. They left Egypt. Okay. Yeah. Yashumi Mitzrayim lo yachu. I have a, have a chapter in my Haggadah on that on that connection between the story of Lot in 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 Sodom and and uh, Israel and Egypt. And I have a whole chapter in my Haggadah about that. Parallel between is Lotin with Sodom and Israel and Egypt. There's it about 15 parallels between the two stories. It means that had Israel been able to tarry, we would have. We, we would not have left Egypt. We were kicked out. But we had difficulty leaving Mitzrayim, just as Lot had difficulty in leaving Sodom. Because you were in a certain places, as bad as it may be, you become attached to it, even with the persecution. And you sort of buy into some of the values too, which is the story of Lot and Sodom. You know, he gives over his daughters. That's uh, very Sodom like. And Israel and Egypt, uh, you know, there's, we, it's not easy to leave Egypt behind. We have the golden calf, which is, you know, the gold we took from Egypt. So that's the, and in some of the other books of the prophetic writings, it's very clear, Yechezkel says especially, but other writings as well, that you were, that we were connected to Mitzrayim, and there's a process, it takes a generation or more to leave Mitzrayim behind. So that's, the, the Yitzma may appears three times. It's, it's in, with Lot. I would say here it's the contrast of Judah and Lot. I would say Reuben and Lot are one type and Judah's opposite. Then you come to the third case of Yitzma Meya and Mitzrayim, which is, which is Lot. The Chumash presents us in Egypt as a kind of Lot figure. Lot was sent back to Abraham, he never makes it back. The people that leave Mitzrayim never get back, and all kinds of other parallels, interesting parallels between those two things. That's what, that's the third time we have it, three times with Mitzvah Mayor. Thank you. Okay, so we still have some more time. I have a, quite, then, a comment. Yes. Oh. Comment, yes. yes. Um, that you were saying that when um, Yehuda speaks about Ani Arev and he's emulating um, 
Jacob taking responsibility with Lot, but he also um, surpasses Jacob because you also mentioned that when when um, Lot said, "What about these idols who stole them?" and Jacob, Lava, you mean you mean you mean, uh, you mean uh, uh, Lava, Lava, Lava says right. Lava, yes, that Jacob yeah. does not take responsibility. So Jacob right. is both. He took and then he doesn't take. And, but Yehuda is willing to take responsibility completely. Agreed. But Jacob takes responsibility later, as we'll see. Jacob does take responsibility. That last speech, he takes responsibility for Rachel at the end of his life. Uh -huh. he's, that's what he, I mean, it's, again, the book, you have to wait, but you're 100% you're right. And the story of Jacob in the house of Laban, there is a failure to take responsibility. The brothers actually take responsibility. When, when, they, when they find the money in the sack of one of the brothers, they say, what has God done to us? Right. Not to you, to us. And it's true that Yaakov in the house of Laban doesn't take responsibility and doesn't take responsibility for Rachel. Whoever took it should die is not the right answer. Right. He should say, whoever took it should die, and I'm also responsible. You could right. say that. And even in the first case, when Rachel says, give me children or else I will die, he doesn't have any sympathy for that. He says, listen, I have my children. You know, it's your problem. What am I, God or something? And that he could have said something in a different way, even if he can't help somebody, he says, I'd love to help you. Right, but you know, I I I I I I empathize with your plight. Let's mm -hmm. think together. Maybe we can pray together. Maybe we can do something. I mean, he's pretty industrious when it comes to producing children for the flocks of Lavan, and to put mm -hmm. in money in his own pocket. Torah spends a fair amount of time about Jacob, how he figures it all out, how he's going to get all the best animals for himself. So he's pretty good at that, actually, for sort of for a sort of genetic engineering when it comes to mm -hmm. the to the speckled and spotted animals. And the point in Rashi takes him to task, that's not the way you speak to her. He supposedly, supposedly loves her, but the way he talks, listen, it's not my problem, he says. And so that changes later. When it changes, really the relationship with Rachel changes after she dies. He begins to take responsibility and he tries to figure a way to include Rachel. She died because she steals idols. She dies on the way back to the land. Mm -hmm. And then Yaakov has to figure out, how do I understand that? And he chooses to give a generous assessment of Rachel. She was on. She, she was. She, she was returning. She was coming back when she died. I'm going to sort of bring her all the way back. But then it does later on in the Chumash. That's one of the great. That's one of the great speeches in Breshit. That's as uh, Chaim alluded to before, when Yaakov speaks to Yosef at the end of his life, and he sort of reviews his life and he sort of reinterprets his life in terms of Joseph, in terms of Rachel, etc., the family, how to include Joseph, and all that. We'll get there hopefully. Um, I mean, an yes. observation that I believe you've made weeks ago, but but this chapter in your discussion today really emphasizes that Bereshit about our patriarchs. It's not it, it's not presenting ideal men, but the but the dynamic um, dealing with and facing all of us our flaws and our limitations and our sins. And that that's the way to be a human being. Right. I do think the Chumash cares very deeply where you end up. I don't think the Chumash cares so much about mistakes made along the way, because that's how we learn. But the fact of the matter is that Jacob ends up as, as, as the great hero. He figures out a way to, first of all, to build a family. Number two, he figures out, he accepts upon himself the, all the pain and the suffering, understanding it's necessary to build a family. And he's part of this covenantal process. Uh -huh. So he is, I would say, the great hero of the book. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's not the only hero. But they're all, look, it's not, you know, it's, but when you, the Chumash, the greatness of it, and, and I think the, the depth of it is all the characters, all of them, all the main characters are very complicated characters, not just the heroes. Asa was a complicated guy. On one hand, he's sympathetic to Asaph. On the other hand, the language around Asaph is very negative, actually. So it's complex. People are complicated. And that's what makes it a great, credible book, because it's, it is highly nuanced, all of them. Uh, they're, all, you know, they're all different, and they're very rich characters. Yes. But this is, this is certainly one of the great turning points. And Yaakov's response, as is Esther's response to Mordechai, Esther was willing to do nothing. 
she says, my hands are tied. What can I do? I'm not taking the risk. It's too dangerous or whatever it is. And she also says something else. It's against the law, she says. Achat dato, it's one of the key words of the Megillah. She's a good Persian. They have all their laws, you know? Now you have to wonder when you read the Megillah, what the Megillah thinks about all these laws. Because all the laws basically serve one purpose, which is to help Achashverosh. All mm-hmm. the rules. Yeah, there's all kinds of rules. There's rules about the women that are imprisoned in his harem, the 12 months of the beauty treatments, right? They have this, also have laws, six months with this, with these oils and six, right? This is the, the this is the dot. Kedat Hanoshim Shneim But it always, the law, there's a lot of laws, but there's no real law. It's all about one guy, basically. Mm-hmm. So it's, you know, the, Esther, when Esther says, I can't go to the king, it's against the law. She's talking like a very good Persian. I mean, all the Jews have been mourning in the whole 127 provinces, and she seems to know nothing about it. So, so she has to come around to, to, to accept this at great personal risk, because no one even knows she's a Jew. It's a great personal risk, and she does it, that she's the great hero. So here, too, it's Jacob's response to Judah. It's what, it's what the Megillah picked up. You have these two people. One is saying, I'll, I'll take full responsibility. And the other says, I, the other responds positively. Because Jacob understands what Judah is saying. He's, part of it, he once said himself, he's okay, so he, I'll respond in kind. And may God have mercy on us soul. And whoever, whatever happens, happens. I'm not convinced it's going to work. That's the point I'm emphasizing. Same with Esther. Kasher avadati avadati. Good chance it won't work. But we'll do the best we can. That's the most we can say. What do we know? Right? We, what do we know? Mordechai said it actually to Esther. Umi yodea kozoti got Who knows, he says. Maybe this is why you became the queen. Umi yodea. Who knows? And what's interesting in the Megillah, and I put this out in my book on the Megillah, is that the king in the first chapter of the Megillah, when he has a problem with Vashti, he goes to his wise, his advisors, they called Yodei Ha'itim, those who know the times, right? But Mordechai says, Mi Yodei Imriyet Kazot, name of my book, who knows at this time if it's going to work? So the idea of not knowing. Rabbi Nachman said, the highest level of knowledge is to know you don't know. And Mordechai says, we, we're going to do this not because we're certain it's going to work. Because who knows? What do we know? We know nothing, you know? But you do the right thing at the time and you hope it's going to work. And Esther says, I'll do it. If I fail, I fail. If I'm destroyed, I'm destroyed. It's the same thing as it's exactly what Yaakov says. Kasher shokolti, shokolti. If I'm bereft, I'm bereft. Whatever happens, happens. We're going to take a chance. If I lose Binyamin, I lose it. But this is what we're going to do. Okay, so now let us continue. We have a few minutes left here. So now fine. So Jacob is given permission. Now we're set to go. And they took the uh, the offering that Jacob had sent. They got up and went down to Egypt. And they stand before Joseph. It's a very striking word. They, 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 tried to present, they literally stood. They stood before Joseph. And I was thinking in this expression to stand before Joseph, that when the Torah speaks about standing before somebody. We just read it in last week's Parsha, actually, Parsha Yitro, that Yitro came to visit Moshe. Moshe is sitting down, and Yitro says, Why are you sitting down? And all the people are standing before you from morning till evening. To stand before someone sometimes means to stand in, the, in the judgment. And that actually is what's happening over here, unbeknownst to themselves. It's not really about the food. It's not really about anything more than there's a larger part of the narrative, which is at the end of the day, they did essentially attempt to kill Joseph. Okay, he was picked out of the pit, but not just to kill him, because one can ask the question, it's what the Medrash picked up, at the end of the day, the 17-year-old boy for virtually his entire life is separated from the family, grows up as, as an Egyptian with all those challenges. And the Chumash wants us to wonder, I think, from time to time, what might have happened to Joseph if he had stayed with his father? 
Mm-hmm. You have Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Maybe there'll be Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. Who knows? But certainly they have, his life has taken a different turn because of what they did. And they have to take responsibility for that as well. It's not just trying to kill him, which they did try to kill him, but, but it's more than that. It's They're responsible in some sense for the way Joseph ends up. And he does end up, uh, and this is the question, to some extent, he's the Egyptian. From every outward appearance, he's the Egyptian. And he named his first son Menashe, which means forgetfulness. Let's take one more verse over here. Every verse has something to it. It's uh, Vayar Yosef Itamid bin Yamin. Joseph sees Benjamin with them. Vayomer Rasha Beito. Hoveya to Anoshim Habaita. Bring these people, Habaita, to the house, means to his house, his own special house. Utuboach Tevach Vahachem. And take and slaughter an animal, prepare an animal. Ki iti Yochu Anoshim Batsoarayim for these men who dine with me at noon. So there's a lot in this verse, and we'll pick up next week with this, but I wanted to say a couple of things about the verse right now. First of all, presumably it means that we know that the Egyptians um, did not appreciate uh, uh, people having cattle. We know the Egyptians, they, apparently they wouldn't eat the meat that was slaughtered in this way. When Joseph says to the man on his house, bring them to my, to the house and slaughter and, and prepare an animal, to boach tevach v'hachem, prepare an animal, because they're eating with me, they're not eating with the Egyptians, says Joseph. They're eating with me, the Jew, because Joseph is the Ivri. The man in his house knows that Joseph is, is the Ivri, is the Hebrew, and the Hebrews eat meat. So these are Hebrews coming from, from the land of Canaan, and they can, they can eat meat, and so do I. So bring it to my house, and we're going to eat together. Because we, they can have meat, and I can have meat. We'll see about this later on. That's one thing. So he's telling the guy in his house, he's telling him, you know, I'm, I'm, they're Hebrews, I'm Hebrews. There's some, you know, some point in something in common. But you can't read the verse, Tevoach Tevach V'achein, without thinking of something else which is when Joseph came to Egypt back in chapter 39, he finds himself in the house, um, in the house of Potiphar, right? Potiphar is the chief butcher, the Sarhat HaBachim, the chief butcher. Whether he butchers animals or butchers people is a very good question. But that's who Potiphar is. And that's where Joseph finds himself when he first comes to Egypt. Um, that's found in chapter, 30, chapter 39. He's in the bayit of, uh, of, of Potiphar. And Potiphar appoints him over the bayit. And verse number five as well. Etc. Over and over again, the word bayit. Um, so the point is that he goes that to the bayit to do his labor. That's the story of Mrs. Potiphar. So you have to wonder over here. When Joseph says, Utavoach tevach v'hachein, and the, we, the reader, are remembering Potiphar. We remember where Joseph first, at first ends up when he goes to Mitzrayim, which is, of course, totally their fault. So you have to wonder over here to what extent, to what extent <laughs> the Chumash is already, there's something about the story which is very fraught. Entering the house of Joseph over here is not so simple. And at this one last point, because Yaakov had said, to bring a, a mincha, to bring a gift down to Joseph. The gift consists of food. And if, in fact, in chapter 43, just to conclude with this, later on, says that before Joseph came to the house, they actually prepared the mincha. Um, let's find that verse, verse number 25 of chapter 43. They prepared the gift before Joseph came at noon. So you have two different verses. Joseph is preparing, he says, right? Prepare the meat, slaughter the teva, slaughter, prepare and slaughter the animal. And there being mechin the mincha, which is intended to assuage the ish's feelings, to appease the ish. 
but at the very same time they're being mechi in the mincha, he's being mechi in the tevach, which on one end is a very nice thing with ice meal, but in the background we're thinking about the tevach and the tabachim and the sour tabachim and Joseph's whole experience of coming down to Egypt in the house of the butcher and then in the jail, etc. And all of those things are before us. And the reader, we're wondering actually, if you haven't read the story before, where this is going to end up, because there's got to be a lot of residual anger here, without question. And there's been a lot of already a lot of manipulation. What is this all about? What is Joseph thinking? So we'll pick up with this next week. Um, so I'll stop at this point. And uh, yeah. We'll pick up next week. If anybody has a last comment or question, I'll take it now. Anybody comment or question? Ruth, you had something to say? Uh, uh, not what I typed. I, are you, I don't think you can answer this now, but the, my question has always been and still remains, why does Yehuda meet Mamea? He didn't speak up right away when Ruvain said what he said. He waited months before he steps forward. Right, it's so Rashi says what? Rashi says, Rashi answers your question. Uh, yeah, but I don't buy it. So <laughs> that's okay. You don't buy what Rashi says. Rashi says he waited for uh, things to get worse before he, he picked his book. Harav Kaved Baharet. Yeah. Rashi, you have to pick the time when people can hear what you're saying. And he understands. I think that's actually very true in terms of teaching. I know that's for sure true. Yes. You can say the same thing a hundred times. No one hears it. One day, I remember in my class, and I'll just conclude with this. I, I remember who it was. I was talking about the, the covenant being gay with Abdul Dinu, being a stranger, being enslaved, being molested or tortured. Mm-hmm. And that's those are the Abraham said, what is our responsibility? And and I how many times have I spoken about it? And one is one and someone in my class said, one second, you say you have to endure that kind of suffering to enter into the covenant. Mm-hmm. And I say, well, that's what the Chumash does say. But I have a question for you. You heard this from me at least a dozen times. You didn't say one word. How come now? And the truth of the matter is, it's a very important educational point about people being able to hear something. I speak about myself. You hear something many times, and never suddenly, because something changes probably in your own life, and suddenly you hear things differently. And that's, the, I think, the educational point that Rashi is making, whether he intends this or not, I'm not sure. But Judah understands that Jacob is so into his own misery. There's no point. You know, it's like trying to console somebody when they, before the burial. You don't do that because what's the point? It's, it's, you, you know, beta with the You wait for the right moment. Mm-hmm. I think that's part of the cleverness of Judah. He waits until things get really bad and the, there really is no logical option at this point. So and everybody's screaming and yelling. He says, one second, mm-hmm. this has got to be this way. There's only, we only have one choice. If you want to send them down, we're getting food. And if not, mm-hmm. Oh, we, what'd you say? What'd you say? He said, well, but, but, listen, I'll, I'll take responsibility. There's no choice. We can't, we can't, we can't delay. Wave my money. I'll take responsibility. It's me for the sake of everybody, not just you. And then Jacob hears it. He says, yeah, okay, I got it. And may God, and, be, and may God be with you. I mean, it's a, to me, it's a great, great scene of you. Uh, okay, I'll stop here and we will continue next week with the brothers in the house of Joseph. There's a lot to be said about that, and we will continue. Okay, very good. Thank you. Anybody has any other questions? You can always email me, dsilber at drisha.org. Happy to hear from you. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rabbi Silber. Um, and thank you, everyone who is here and part of our learning community. I just want to let you know that we will be meeting next week on President's Weekend for this class. The Torah stops for no one. Um, so uh, we also have a variety of other op- offerings available this semester with Jerusha, including public lectures, private Talmud shares, and continuing our Yiddish translation workshop. You can learn more about all of those amazing classes and register at jerisha.org. See you next week.